Hello everyone and welcome to our keynote session. I'm Jules Johnson with Learning Ally. Doug Spry with Learning Ally is also here. You will see him down in the chat box. Feel free to chat with us. I see it going now, the chat box. Feel free to chat with that throughout the entire session. If you have a question for Max, you'll notice the Q&A box. You can actually move that around your screen, make it bigger, whatever you would like to do, but type your question there and we will get as many of those as possible to him at the end of his speech. So let's go ahead and introduce Max. I'll tell you a little bit about him. He is a best-selling author, Max Brooks. He's credited with propelling zombie lore from niche subculture fascination to mainstream pop culture obsession. He's published, published three massively successful zombie-themed books, World War Z, the Zombie Survival Guide, and the Zombie Survival Guide Recorded Attacks. His newest book is a historical graphic novel. It's called The Harlem Hellfighters. Max is also dyslexic. In 2014, he delivered a passionate speech before Congress urging them to take action. He also just accepted a non-resident senior fellowship at the Atlantic Council, which is the prestigious Washington think tank. Max is here today to share more with us in his keynote speech called Taking on World War D, Dyslexia. Max, we are so glad you're here. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, I've never done this before. I've never actually done an online keynote, so I'm not really sure how this is going to work, but I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, my life and uh, growing up with dyslexia and uh, how I lived with it and how I thrived despite it. Uh, I'm 43 years old, so I grew up late 70s, early 80s uh, in school, and school and I were not friends. I did not do well in school, and I probably would have dropped out and, or at the very least, not had a successful life if not for my mother. My mother was a prestigious actress. And Bancroft, uh, and she put her career on hold because she knew something was wrong. Because the teachers kept saying that I uh, is a very bright boy. I remember hearing that very bright boy. Well, I was very bright, and I certainly wasn't lazy, but for some reason it wasn't clicking. I wasn't understanding what was happening. I wasn't taking tests well, and I wasn't comprehending what I was reading. I I, I couldn't read. Uh, so my mother uh, had me tested. She, I don't know how she found out because she took a lot of these secrets to the grave with her. My mother's passed on. But she took me to a place called the Marion Frostick Center in Pasadena, California. And I was tested and diagnosed uh, with dyslexia. And because of that, she was able to sort of tailor make a program for me to survive. Uh, because, now, th this is the thing, I went to a very, very good, very high quality and very expensive private school on the west side of Los Angeles. Uh, this, this was supposed to be the best education money could buy, and they didn't know what to do with me. And some of the teachers thought that I was lazy and that this was a choice. They thought I was just goofing off. Uh, I had one teacher in particular who used to say to me, well, you can do it, you just don't want to do it. Why would I not want to study? Why would I not want to do well in school? Uh, because when you're a kid, you can only judge your self-worth by, by either sports, which I have no interest in, or academics, which I wasn't doing well in. So why would I not want to do well? So the school had, didn't know about dyslexia. The school didn't know how to treat it. So my mother had to become my advocate, and my mother had to become uh, sort of the commander-in-chief of my dyslexia curriculum. So she invented, over the years, a bunch of coping mechanisms. Uh, the first one that, that, that she realized, the first thing that she realized <clears throat> was that the dyslexia was really not the problem. The big problem was the self-esteem issues. Like I said before, uh, your self-esteem is only judged either through sports or academia. Uh, and when you try and try and fail and fail, your self-esteem takes a huge dive, and, and that's the damage. That's the, the hole that you have to climb out of. Uh, because the, the damage is caused by the anxiety. 
what happened was I started to to ingest the fact that I was doing the worst in the class. And so what happened was I started to believe that I couldn't accomplish tasks. And therefore, when I would sit down and take a test, the anxiety would crush me much worse than the dyslexia. So my mother started to develop an anti-anxiety program for me. Uh, number one was untimed tests. That was the most important thing. Uh, I could take tests separately from the rest of the class. So I wouldn't have to watch them sort of get up and leave and leave me there. I could take it separately. That was, that was huge for anxiety reduction. Uh, number two was tutoring. My mother made sure that I was tutored uh, for an hour, maybe two hours a day, uh, depending on the subject matter. I usually had like a standard tutor, uh, starting in first grade. And then as the classes got more difficult, I started to also have specialized tutoring in, in languages, you know, Latin or Spanish. Uh, and that helped because a lot of the tutoring was simply, and this is the problem, a lot of the tutoring was just one-on-one -on -one going over what I had learned in the classroom because I simply couldn't keep up. So I had to sort of review everything I had learned that day. Uh, another really important thing was audiobooks. Like I said before, reading was very hard for me. And it, it crushed my love of reading for a very long time. And what I learned also was when you're dyslexic, you never, ever read in front of the class. And I remember trying to read something about JFK, and that was, uh, I stuttered, and, and I screwed up, and the kids laughed, and I just felt miserable. And I learned just never, never read from prepared speeches ever again. Uh, a coping mechanism that my mother developed for me was uh, just speaking from the heart. And, and being able to, to tell teachers before that, like I'm doing right now. I'm not reading from a prepared speech uh, because my mother told me that I'm going to have to go to my teachers or whomever I will be presenting and say, look, I can't read from a prepared speech or a teleprompter. That's just not going to happen. So my speeches may seem a little rough. They may seem a little unpolished. Um, but it's, they're going to be from the heart. And as a result, I became a great public speaker. And getting back to audiobooks, my mother took my reading list from, from the, for the entire year, every year, every academic year, my mother would take all the books I had to read for English class to the Institute for the Blind, uh, Braille Institute, and would have them transcribed onto audiobooks so I could listen uh, to my books. And that was really important. And, and my mother, like I said, was my advocate because she lobbied the school and had to say to them, look, this kid learns differently than everyone else. Uh, he can learn through his ears and not necessarily through his eyes. So therefore, if he has to listen to his books, it does not mean he is lazy. It does not mean he is copping out or cheating. That is simply how he learns. Uh, so I think those kind of coping mechanisms was speaking from the heart instead of prepared speeches, uh, audiobooks, untimed tests, uh, various tutoring. I think all of those sort of got me through school. Uh, but you know the the, the self-esteem damage was was pretty intense uh, because the one thing I didn't have back in the day was heroes. Uh, Nobody really knew much about dyslexia back then, and I didn't have anyone to look up to. And I, and I think, I, I can't stress that enough. I think it's, it's so important for anybody who is struggling with anything needs to be able to look at someone else and say, oh, well, they did it, so can I. You know, I mean, if, if you go to any African-American community center, the walls are just plastered with black heroes to say to young African-American kids, look, they, they did it and you can too. Yes, we can. Well, we didn't have any yes, we can heroes when I was a kid. We didn't know about people like Einstein, uh, you know, Charles Schwab. We didn't know about the great thinkers. Uh, when I was a kid, 
they told me uh, they told me that I could accomplish uh, getting over dyslexia because of Bruce Jenner. That's all we had was Bruce Jenner. Uh, now, back in the day, this is when Bruce Jenner actually had a job. This is when he was a decathlon athlete. Now, even as a 10-year-old kid, I realized, well, wait a minute. I, I don't want to spend the rest of my life jumping over things with a stick. So unless I become a pole vaulter, knowing that Bruce Jenner is dyslexic does not help me. Uh, so that was hard. I sort of felt like I was all alone on this. Uh, and then later meeting other kids and having to sort of come out about our dyslexia to, to each other because it wasn't easy. But that was something that my mother did was she identified all the other kids in my classes who had learning disabilities. And so we could all sort of band together and sort of share uh, how we were struggling. And I think that was really important because uh, there's no worse feeling than feeling like you're all alone and you're, you're some sort of uh, misfit and loser and, and nobody can understand what you're going through. Uh, so what my mother understood was dealing with the emotional damage as well as the academic damage. And so, and so I got through it and I accomplished it. Uh, as a result, uh, I somehow managed to get through college, I somehow managed to get through graduate school, and I somehow have managed to make a career writing. Now, uh, that, that doesn't mean that the, the anxiety is gone, that doesn't mean that uh, the, the self-criticism is gone, I still deal with it. Uh, when I still make mistakes, when I was writing World War Z, I actually hired a fact checker because I didn't trust myself. Turns out I got almost everything right, uh, but it doesn't matter. I still don't trust myself. So I, I didn't beat any of those issues, but I have learned to live with them. And most importantly, I have learned not to let them get in my way. Uh, so that has been sort of my struggles with dyslexia. and. I, I think nowadays we're in a much better position in that we understand. Uh, we understand dyslexia, we know that it's a real condition, we know that kids are not being lazy, they're not messing around. The question now is we have to educate the parents and we also have to educate the educators because now, thank God, my son is not dyslexic but he's got a, he's got a whole uh, bevy of other issues. And so our job is to always be his advocate and to meet other parents uh, who have kids with dyslexia because right now, I'm, like I said, I still live on the good side of LA. I live on, on the west side of LA with the most expensive, supposedly best private schools in the country and I am watching them destroy children with dyslexia. I'm, I am at present now watching a little girl being annihilated because she has a little bit of dyslexia and the school doesn't know what to do so they're blaming her and they are blaming the parents and they're saying that uh, well not only is she not learning she's taking time away from the other kids and now they're giving her all these psychological problems in which they're saying well now she needs a therapist and the parents still are clinging to the hope and this is a direct quote from the dad that she'll grow out of it uh, that maturity will catch up well, parents, let me, let me tell you right now, you never grow out of dyslexia. You never do. It's, it's not a phase. Uh, it's not a hormone thing. Uh, you will have dyslexia the rest of your life. And I cannot stress dealing with it as soon as humanly possible. Because the quicker you get in there, the quicker you can forestall the real issues, which are the emotional issues and the psychological issues, the self-esteem and the anxiety. Because every moment you delay, it gets worse and it builds. And those are the issues that this child will have to spend the rest of their life untangling. Um, for me, I can tell you, when I got to grad school and my anxiety went down, my self-esteem issues went, went away, uh, I sat down to take tests and I blew through them. And it made me realize, wow, the dyslexia was actually only 20% of my problem. The 80% was all the other issues. So dealing with it as quickly as possible. 
and teachers, I can tell you, uh, identifying it as quickly as possible. Uh, teachers, you don't need to solve it. There, there's experts out there, there's plenty of organizations out there that will solve it, that will help you, that will work with you, work with the parents, but your job is to flag these kids and flag them soon. And sometimes, whereas a lot of parents advocate for their kids with the teachers, sometimes the teachers have to advocate for the parents. The teachers have to say, look, you're, this is important. Your kid may have a learning disability and we need to get him or her tested. So that, that's my sort of quick spiel on my experience growing up with dyslexia uh, and what I believe we can do to solve it. So I, I would love to open the floor uh, to your questions. Hey, Max, we have a ton of questions, so I'm going to just kind of go through some of the most popular ones here just to try to, because we have some themes that are continuing to come up. The first one that a lot of people have asked is, do you rely on any form of assistive technology to help you write your books? Because you're dyslexic and you're a best-selling author, so a lot of people are asking if you use any kind of assistive text, speech to text, or speech to text, anything like that. That's a real, that's a really good question. Uh, I have to say that my my best technological ally is Audible because I have to read a lot of books. I have to read a lot of big, dry, boring textbooks, uh, which, I, which honestly, if I sat down to read them, I would never get through them. Never. Uh, I'm working on a Civil War project, and there's no way I'm going to read Battle Cry of Freedom. It's, it's this big. So what I do is I download the audio book of Battle Cry of Freedom onto my iPad. And I have the hard copy next to me. So what I do is I listen to the audiobook while I've got the hard copy in front of me. And whenever there's something important, I just press pause on the audiobook and then I underline that chapter or that section. So what happens is once I'm done with the audiobook, I then have a hard copy which is dog eared and outlined with notes, because you can't you can't go back and reference an audiobook. But if it wasn't for audiobooks, if it wasn't for Audible, uh, I would never survive. Uh, another important research tool for me, if it's a subject I know nothing about, is uh, documentaries. Uh, what I do is, if I'm delving into a subject that I'm just a complete ingenue, uh, I st start by just watching a really basic, bare-bones documentary just to get a, a big picture sense of what I'm getting into. And then I baby step my way into the research. Uh, I may then go to a uh, so elementary school textbook, or then, or I might go to graphic novels. Graphic novels are amazing. They're a wonderful way for uh, dyslexic people like me to learn. Uh, I didn't read until I started reading comic books. Comic books taught me how to read. So all these other mediums are segues into the really heavy lifting of, of dry textbooks. Next question. Hey, um, we actually have a lot of people asking if you can provide some kind of information or write a book for educators, but I have a really interesting question from an educator herself. Sadie says, how can we as educators help students with dyslexia and other disabilities when they maybe have less supportive parents than you had at home? So she's asking how teachers can actually help at school. Okay, there's, there's a couple things. That's a really good question. It's like I said before, you know, we, we sort of, uh, the parents out there, all of you parents who've logged in, are doing this because you want to help your kids and you want to advocate for your kids and you're like my mom. But, like I was saying before, that little girl that's being destroyed by the school, well, the parents aren't helping because the parents are still hoping that that this will go away. And, and I don't want to make broad gender generalizations, but I have noticed just in my personal experience that there, that there are differences between the parents. And, and I, won't, I won't gender stereotype, but what I will say is there tends to be one parent who thinks the kid is lazy and says, well, they just need to work harder. And then there's another parent who tends to be very socially conscious and is very ashamed, doesn't want to doesn't doesn't want to admit that their kid is is LD with the other parents and, and God forbid doesn't want to put their kid in a special school uh, you know that that would be terrifying uh, that would just be uh, humiliating and it's hard and and teachers you've if if you really care you've got a rough job in front of you because unfortunately what 
48 of our 50 states don't have mandatory dyslexic recognition training. That's what I said to Congress. I said all teachers should have to take mandatory dyslexic recognition training classes so they can flag these kids early on. Now, a lot of states haven't done that. So unfortunately, for a teacher, the first thing you've got to do is find the resources out there to recognize it. And then you've got to advocate to the parents. And that's such a hard job. And, and unfortunately, if you don't have the parents on board, you, you can nibble around the edges. But the most important thing you can do as a teacher, once you flag that kid, is maybe work within the school system to reduce the anxiety with the kids. Figure out how best to make sure that this kid doesn't feel like a loser and a weirdo, uh, and be as supportive as possible. And, and make sure that these kids know that A, if they do have a learning disability, there are plenty of successful people out there that have been where they've been and have done what they've done and can survive it. Next question. Kristen R. She is asking Max, do you have any videos online for kids who are just coming up now? If not, would you consider making one? I think it's so important for our kids to see the many successful dyslexic individuals. So do you have or know of anything like that? And she's asking if you do one. Uh, I don't actually know if, the, if there is one. I, <clears throat> I, of course I would do one. Uh, I think I think what should be important is I, I don't know if there is, but I would love if there was sort of a national database that sort of kids could log on to and you could just see all of your heroes. Uh, I think that would be really important. Everybody needs heroes. And like I said, I wish there had been a hero for me other than a guy who pole vaulted over a stick with another stick. Uh, so I think what's what's needed is some sort of national website where you can just log on and bam look at all these people people who use their brains uh, and their brains are not broken their brains are just different and look what they've been able to accomplish with these amazing brains uh, you know what I, what I think is crazy and I see this in, and, and you all know this as parents uh, you go into a classroom and you see pictures up on the wall of all these amazing adults you know uh, pioneers in women's rights or, or racial justice or science or, and yet none of these adults were the kind of kids that could sit at circle time and I think I think there needs to be uh, more of a dialogue and I think we need to do have we need to have more of these videos and we need to have uh, more like I said of a website where we could all look and say oh all these successful people struggled in school they did not do well. They fought with their teachers. They were sent out of the room. Thomas Edison was kicked out for asking too many questions. I wonder if he was dyslexic. So I would love to go back and, and find the, out who these heroes are. So yeah, and if there was a video, I don't, know, I don't know how much of a hero I could be, but I think there's people certainly more accomplished and more successful than me that I think would make great subjects for videos. And the next question that we have comes in from Sharon. She's wondering, Max, if your parents or if you in school used an Orton-Gillingham program or if you used just one-on-one -on -one help with a higher level of repetition. So did you actually have Orton-Gillingham? Do you know? No, uh, we did not have Orton-Gillingham. Uh, that was not the program we used. We used uh, the Ann Bancroft program. And that was what I was describing. And we really had to cobble it together from scratch. Uh, and my mother had to go find uh, tutoring services in Los Angeles. Uh, it, I mean, it literally, it literally was sort of patchworking it all together, and, and the schools were, were really sort of no help. I mean, back in the day, they, some, some of the schools wanted to help, but they just didn't know how. And where I live in Los Angeles, it's gotten even worse, because now the Los Angeles Unified School District is a sunken ship. So all the private schools are like lifeboats, and they don't want, they just don't want kids who are dyslexic. They don't want difficult kids. Uh, this, the high school that I went to, I went to Crossroads, very good high school, proud of I went, but 
they literally just told, I don't send my kid there now because they just told another parent, look, uh, your kid's got dyslexia, that's their problem. You fix it. We have another question from Veronica. She says, my 11-year-old considers accommodations a cheat. What advice do you have for kids on things like that, having the test read to them, letting them know that that's okay to use those accommodations like that? I think uh, th there's no there's no substitute for just telling them it's not cheating. That's ridiculous. That's like saying if you're a diabetic, taking insulin is cheating. Uh, it's not an accommodation in that way. It's not a it's not a crutch. It's a difference. And I think we have to we have to change the dyalog. Everybody learns differently. Uh, you know that's like saying that Jimi Hendrix was one of the greatest guitar players who ever lived but he played the guitar with his left hand he was a lefty so he had to restring his guitar so he could play with the left hand that's not cheating that's who he was uh, I think that if we have a narrative in this country that there is a right way and a wrong way to learn then kids are going to feel like they're cheating or they're going to feel like they're weak and they're going to feel um, like they like they can't mix it up with the big boys and that's just not true that's just not right I think we need to celebrate diversity not just in the racial gender or gender preference world we need to celebrate diversity in the educational world and so every kid who learns differently doesn't feel like they're less than the other kids who are in the majority. You're going to have to go back and read this chat, Max, after you're done. Um, Veronica said, thank you for answering my question. I'm going to show it to my son. So you're getting so much praise. People are just loving this. The next question we have, and boy, this gets to the heart of the issue. Julie, she says, my son is nine years old. He says he's the dumbest one in his class. It breaks my heart. What would your advice be for me as his mom to help turn his opinion around of his self? I think that's a, I think that's a great example. Uh, once again, uh, go to the heroes. Go to whoever he admires. He needs to understand that they all felt like the dumbest ones. I guarantee you that little Albie Einstein got his knuckles hit by some horrible German teacher who just said, why, why are you not, uh, you're not memorizing? I, you, you, I just, go sit in the corner with the dunce cap. We all have a struggle. And, and to this kid, this nine-year-old, it feels like he's the dumbest one. Let me tell you something, buddy. I felt that way all the time. I always felt like the dumbest kid. You are not the dumbest kid. Difference does not mean dumb. And we can go back and find that as we were growing up in all these fairy tales. The ugly duckling was not an ugly duckling. He was a swan. He was different. And that's what we need to stress. Difference is not dumb. Our next question comes from Carrie. She says, will you ever write a story featuring a dyslexic character so that the rest of the world can see how amazing you are? Yes, yes. I, I think that's, that's, gotta, that's gotta be more of an agenda for me. I've gotta uh, put that in uh, with, other, with what I do. Uh, you know, it literally, it, it was not an issue for me until I had a kid. And until my kid, who is not dyslexic, but who has learning disabilities, it's sort of, uh, you know, it's like Godfather 3. They pull me back in. It's like I'm pulled back into the LD community. And I might not have been. I might have just gone on my merry way had I not been pulled right back into this struggle and advocating for my kid and seeing what happens with other kids and, and hearing parents. I mean, when I, when I testified before Congress, there was a, a, a congressman with tears in his eyes talking about his daughter and the pain and the shame and the frustration and the anger. And this doesn't have to happen. So yeah, I, I, I think what I can do in my next writing projects is make sure that I put some character in there that's struggled with dyslexia. 
And we had a comment down in the chat. I just want to read it. Um, Wendy, she said, Max, my son wants you to make sure that your book with the dyslexic character is on Learning Ally so he can read it. I thought that was wonderful. So we'll make sure to get that on Learning Ally when you write it. Um, Dr. Kelly Sandman Hurley is here. She's from the Dyslexia Training Institute. And she asked, what can the kids in the class who do not have dyslexia do to help the kids with dyslexia, either academically or emotionally? So the kids without dyslexia, how can they support and help those who have dyslexia? I think that's a, I think that's a great, great question uh, because everybody has a part to play. Everybody can do something. And kids who don't have dyslexia can treat the kids with dyslexia like they're no different than anybody else. If, if a kid says to you, if you're a kid without an LD and a dyslexic kid tells you, I, I have dyslexia, you say, okay, what is it? Tell me about it. Teach me. Teach me. And that's cool. Everybody's got something different. Uh, this is your difference. So what? Uh, so, you know, treating them just like they're normal. I mean, this is, this is no different than when we were kids in the 70s and the 80s and, uh, and there used to be those really sort of hokey PSAs about how do you treat someone with a disability? And then it's like, well, you treat them like a human being. Duh. So kids who don't have it, just treat them like other kids. We have a lot of really great questions um, coming in, and I'm just looking at some of these on here. Um, one of them comes in from a special education teacher and she says, her name's Michelle, she says, I'm a special education teacher and I find some of my students need support but they don't want to look different. And she wants to give them support like audiobooks or separate setting for tests but she's finding some of them are really embarrassed by that. Do you have any advice for her as a teacher? Yeah, no, I, I think, I think there's a way to educate kids in differences without hitting it right on the nose. And wh what I mean is I use the example of Jimi Hendrix, is you want to reinforce the general narrative of difference before you tackle the difference of the dyslexia. So before you sit the LD kids down and talk about how being different is okay, you want to talk to all the kids about being different. And you can work that into whatever curriculum you're talking about. You know, if you're, if you're teaching a basic math class, uh, you show a picture of Stephen Hawking. You know, if you're in a music class, you talk about Jimi Hendrix. Uh, if you're talking about history, uh, you talk about how Abe Lincoln couldn't get into law school the first time around. Or Winston Churchill couldn't get into Sandhurst because his grades sucked so bad. So... You want to already lay the groundwork for difference. And then you can take the LD kids aside and say, oh yeah, so you're just like Jimi Hendrix or Winston Churchill. Here's a really good one from Beth Kay. How do you think educators and parents can help students with dyslexia deal with standardized testing and anxiety? Yeah, this is, this is really hard. This is a tough one because education in the last 10 years has become really politicized. And we now, I, I encourage everybody to Google John Oliver's program, what he did about standardized testing, because standardized testing isn't just crushing the dyslexic kids. It's crushing the entire country, and it's not helping us one bit. I mean, it, it's been proven after, since No Child Left Behind came in, um, our, our global test scores have not risen one iota. Uh, but what parents and teachers can do with LD kids is you can actually get special uh, special waiver from the state and possibly get an untimed test. I think untimed standardized test is the best thing you can possibly do. Uh, because nothing scrambles a dyslexic kid's brain like a ticking clock. So if you can just do that, if you can find some way uh, to get those standardized tests untimed, uh, it may make a, a world of difference. 
Now here's a great one, and this is something I'm actually dealing with with my own nine-year-old son right now. He was also severely dyslexic. Jen is having the same problem. She asked, uh, Max, did you ever, this is Claudia actually, she asked, Max, did you ever rebel against the intense tutoring? And if so, what did your mom do to deal with this? Did you ever rebel against all of that tutoring? Yeah, yeah, I rebelled, but not in, not in a, a healthy way. I didn't rebel <clears throat> in a way where I just said, I don't want to be tutored. What happened was uh, I, I became what is commonly referred to now as a crispy, which is kids who, by the time they get to college, are so burned out, they don't want to be challenged anymore. Uh, now, I got into a, a, a really, really good college called Pomona which is now, I think, one of the, the most highly regarded schools in the nation. But I didn't want to go because I had struggled every day of my life since the first grade. And I was done. I was done with the tears and I was done with the tutoring and I was done with banging my head against a wall. I was just done. Uh, I just wanted to get through college with as little stress as possible. And so I went to the school right next to Pomona, which was Pitzer, which was a fine school, but it didn't challenge me in the way Pomona would have, uh, and it didn't it didn't enrich me in the way Pomona would have, and it certainly didn't give me the self esteem boost that getting a diploma from Pomona would have. So yeah, I rebelled, and I regret that to this day. I regret that that I didn't challenge myself because I was so burned out on the struggle that that I just I didn't want it anymore. And if I had to do it over again, that's one of the major regrets of my life. I would go back and I would, I would keep struggling. We had a parent ask, what was the turning point for you, Max? You know, in school, you said you're kind of self-esteem down on yourself a little bit, but now you seem so confident, so poised. What was the turning point and when did it happen? Uh, I wish there. I wish I could say if this was a Hollywood movie that there was sort of one dramatic turning point. But the truth is, there's been sort of, l like I said, uh, when you're down in the deep hole of of low self esteem, uh, it it's a long ladder to climb out, and and there have been many rungs along the way. I mean, I'd have to say where I I took a semester away from Pitzer for my semester abroad. And I got on the, uh, I went, ironically, University of the Virgin Islands in, in the Caribbean, which was academically tougher, much tougher than Pitzer, and I got on the dean's list. That never happened before. So that was a rung. Uh, I think afterwards, getting a book published, that was a rung. Uh, then getting my second book published and getting invited to speak at Naval, the Naval War College and at West Point. Uh, and at strategic studies groups all around the country, uh, that was a rung. And having someone from another think tank come up to me and say, I, I've, I've been in government service for 30 years and you got me excited about thinking again, that was a rung. Uh, I do a lot of work in Hollywood for a guy named Thomas Tall. He's legendary pictures. He is legendary and he produces movies like Batman and Pacific Rim. And, and I sort of help... Uh, I, I am sort of his chief strategist for some of his scripts, and I build worlds around his scripts. And there's a moment where this guy, this self-made billionaire, looked at me and goes, how does your brain work that way? So a compliment from him, that was a rung. Uh, and joining the Atlantic Council, so that's an, another rung. So there, I'm, I'm still sort of climbing out of being the dumb kid in the class. Uh, and, and it's still a long ways to go. We got a question from Doug Spry, who's uh, with Learning Ally. He wondered, why did you title this speech World War D? I know we talked about this a little bit offline, but um, why do you think that kind of connects, World War D dyslexia? Well, I, I'd love to say that I thought up that name, but that was actually my, uh, my uh, speaking engagement agent, Mike D'Andrea. God bless him. Um, but it, it is a war because it feels like a fight. You know, again, I, my kid doesn't have dyslexia, but all his other learning disabilities and all his other sensory issues, uh, you, your parents, you know what I'm talking about, the nights spent up at the end of a long day when all you want to do is sleep and yet all you do is talk about your kid and the endless worry and the endless fighting with the schools and the endless advocating and the endless fighting with your kid and, and the trying to find experts 
and weeding out the experts. Some are great, some are not so great. There's a lot of charlatans out there, and we all know, we've all met them. And it really feels like a fight every hour of every day, and, and you just feel, you feel shell-shocked. You know, now we've put our kid in a school for kids with learning disabilities, but every time the phone rings, my wife and I still jump because we think it's, oh God, the school's gonna call us. Uh, so it, it feels like a fight. A and that's why it is a war. And like any war, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of strategic planning, and you're gonna win some battles, and you're gonna lose some battles. But you're, as they used to say in World War II, you're in it for the duration. And that's what it means to be the parent of a dyslexic kid, and that's what it means to be a dyslexic kid. You're in it for the duration. And eventually, you will win. And Max, we have time for one more question. So I'm gonna ask you this one and then kind of let you um, close it out and say bye to everyone. I'll pop back up again at the very end. But um, we have one more question. I think this one is so important. This is from Jennifer. What were your favorite graphic novels growing up? I would love to see if my son, who is 12 years old, might be interested in those. So I know those are very important. We'll let you speak to that. Now listen, graphic novels are really, really important because the thing about reading, and this is what I don't understand about a lot of teachers. You know, a lot of teachers, remember this parents, a lot of teachers became teachers because they loved learning naturally as a kid and they gravitated to it. So it's hard for them to understand why other kids don't. And here's the thing about learning. Like I said, you learn any way you can. My kid didn't want to read. I got him into reading the same way I got into reading, through comic books. Now, I had ROM the Space Night. I didn't have really educational comic books. But now, they have amazing ones. All right, parents, write this down. Capstone Press. Go on Google in another window, or go on Amazon in another window. Capstone Press Historical Graphic Novel Series. They are amazing. They're little, they're short, but they are stories about uh, famous famous heroes, famous battles, famous I events in history. Uh, there's graphic novels that can teach you about science, about math. Uh, there's graphic novels that can teach you about anything nowadays. Visual, learning visually that way is, they're so important. The Capstone Press series, there's, there's nothing like it. Uh, they were instrumental. My kid, like I said, who didn't want to read, started reading those. and. He, and what was more important than the, the discipline of reading, because remember, reading is a discipline. You got to learn it by doing it over and over and over again. And more important than just the discipline of reading that he learned, which was amazing, was he got excited about reading. The accomplishment. He'd read one of these little comic books and he'd put it down, Mom and Dad, finished! Finished! And so he would have a stack of the ones he'd finished and he couldn't wait to get to the next one. And now, my kid, who didn't want to read, is now reading all the Diary of a Wimpy Kid books. So, God bless Capstone Press uh, gra historical graphic novel series. Thank you so much, Max. And I, I know I speak for everyone that you were wonderful. I hope you get a chance to read the chat because people are saying, um, OMG, tears, you're wonderful. They love your mother. They are so excited just about your entire speech. So thank you for that. Um, if you guys want to continue chatting, we do have a lounge and everyone can go to the parent lounge, the educator lounge, there's a high school lounge. Go there, continue talking about uh, this presentation. Enjoy the rest of Spotlight. Don't forget to download the handouts. You can get them here or you can go to our resources tab and you can actually see Max's new historical graphic novel there as well. So thank you all for joining us for our keynote. Enjoy the rest of Spotlights.